it must be about time to start. So, well, welcome to this panel discussion, Waterproof Renewable Membranes. And uh, we've pulled together this, um, well, I say a fantastic panel, I think Motley they are. Crew, yeah. Say again? Motley Crew. Motley Crew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A really good band. Not as good as the Tigers of Pantang, obviously, yeah, but, yeah, you know, yeah. they're, they're almost there. Um, if anybody doesn't know, this is a band from the north of England, formed in 1978, but I saw them on Sunday in Preston. They were absolutely brilliant, so I'll, I'll, I'll advertise them here in front of you a lot. Um, anybody who doesn't know, I'm, I'm Dr. Mark Taylor. Um, work at the University of Leeds in the, the new Institute of Textiles and Colour. Um, and we've been doing research in the sort of outdoor clothing field since the 1970s. Not me, personally. I might look it, but I'm not really that old. Um, but on the panel here, we've got uh, Eric and Andy. Andy, yes. They, they work at Cellguard, who are manufacturers of uh, polypropylene waterproof breathable membrane. Uh, you know it is the one that's used by Heli Hansen. They actually make it, even if, anyway, it's complicated supply chain issues. And then Rudig is here from Sympatex, who I'm sure you're all aware of. He's the CEO of Sympatex, and as he says on his business card, the chief environmental activist. And then joining us online from China, we've got William, a graduate of the University of New South Wales in chemical and materials engineering but he works for King Wanda, who are a manufacturers of TPE membranes for waterproof breathable garments. Hi, William. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm online. Yeah, we can see you. Yeah, we can see, I can see me too. <laughs> <laughs> so I've just got a few questions to start the discussion. And since the theme of this show is uh, the journey to carbon neutrality. I wanted to ask each of the panel members um, about the carbon impact of their products. So shall I start with Rudika because he's closest to me? Okay. I'll try my best, um, even though I want to put that question a bit in context, um, because now we're looking at a membrane, and the membrane probably makes a very tiny portion of the CO2 footprint of any garment. So. I have jumped into this discussion assuming everybody here knows what waterproof people membranes are and what their place is in the product and the supply chain. And I've ignored the fact that there might be people who don't. So if you don't know what we're talking about, do you want to stick your hand up? Oh, great. <laughs> uh, do, you want to, do you want to explain this one? Oh, I was hoping you do because I just joined the industry a few years ago. So, <laughs> so <laughs> there are several ways to make waterproof, breathable garments, but the most common one at the moment is to attach something to a face fabric. And that something will be a membrane or a coating that somehow prevents water from the outside environment passing through to the person inside while still allowing the sweat that they create to evaporate and pass through the membrane. So when we talk about waterproof, breathable membranes, we're talking about one of the two main technologies for applying these chemicals to fabrics. All of these manufacturers here make membranes, which are then glued onto the fabrics. There is another technology where you coat it on, but that's, that's a different thing. So has that cleared it up a little bit? Fantastic. Sorry, Rudiger, carry on. No, no worries. Thank you. So now I know what we're doing. Um, yeah, so if you look at that climate question, and, and we were pretty active in the entire UNCCC activities a couple of years ago, uh, and the first signatories actually of the Carter, um, we signed not for the membrane. We signed for any product we are putting out and ideally to the end product that goes to the customer. And if you read a bit statistics, the climate footprint, about 40% is coloring and that's not part of the membrane issue. So we need to put first things into perspective. That's one side. The other side is we should not ignore anything and we can also make it super complicated. So what we are doing actually is really working intensively in every step of the supply chain from the sourcing of the raw material where we are around the 50-ish percent of waste stream material which we take from agriculture, food production, paper production. So instead of fermenting, we just bring it back into the process and, and create raw material. So we try to reduce the, f let me call it first, the footprint we're doing on the raw material actively. Um, and then in every incremental steps from the conversion of the product as much as 
the creation of the very thin foil, we talk about 10 microns, 15 microns, 20, 25 microns max. Um, even this process, we work with every supplier that he switches to green energy, either by self-production, solar roofs is a typical one, uh, windmills. Uh, as we produce everything in Europe, this is under very tight control of ourselves, so we know all the details of the process. Even though I would say our priority sits in all the other materials we attach, you rightly said, we glue or we put a coating, that means we create a lasting combination of material, so we should not my opinion, we should not look at our responsibility at this nitty-gritty detail, but at the whole composition. Oh, absolutely. And one of the problems with gluing membranes to fabrics is if there's a big difference in the composition, then you make something that perhaps cannot be recycled further down the line, which almost fits the object, doesn't it? So if I may add just, just one small detail, it is at the end, not the process, but is the material we're using. I wouldn't know exactly from the polypropylene, that's not my speciality, but if you compare the traditional PTFE membrane to a polyester membrane, that's what we did scientifically, just this tiny detail makes up to 50% of the footprint of the final garment. So there is an impact, but that impact is not from the production process, but the material we're using. Nobody should use a PTFE membrane, also for other reasons. No, but simply speaking, that's, that's math, that's biology. Um, or chemistry, but the footprint of producing the product is very different by the choice of material, not by the production process itself. Yeah, so, but you, along those lines, then you'd agree that it would be wrong to attach the Simtex membrane to a nylon face fabric? That's the next discussion, probably, when we talk even on circularity and other things. Yeah, absolutely. But, and, and we signed the Carta, so we committed to being at zero by 2030. Uh, and we are progressing exactly, I won't say exactly as plans, we have some surprise in both directions, but roughly speaking, that's a roadmap we are pursuing. Fantastic, thanks Rudiger. So I'm sure you all actually know who Simpitex are, because although Charles said they're manufacturers and people tend not to know who they are, but Simpitex are quite famous, been around for a very long time. Whereas Selgard are relatively, well, I was, Andy was telling me earlier that actually Selgard started in fabrics back in the 1940s, well, actually, yeah, it goes back to about the 1970s. Uh, the, the material, the polypropylene material, was actually designed for textiles. It wasn't the right time. And ultimately, it got adopted in lithium-ion battery. And now we're sort of back to our roots and our heritage. But we're, we're based in an economy that is meant to be circular. You know, Asahi Kasei, our parent company, you know, our goal is to be carbon neutral by 2050. And I think polypropylene in itself helps promote that and its ability to be able to recycle that. And it really it gets down to working with each one of the brands. Uh, and as Trenchant and even uh, Event had, it, are, are both uh, people that we work with and whose materials and the membrane, our membrane they're using, you know, their goal is to be entirely you know, circular within a certain time frame. And when we think of a mono material you know, and, and its ability to recycle it. Well, uh, Trenchant's on its way. Event has that direction, and they're going down that path as well. But um, that is one of the great benefits of polypropylene. Uh, yeah, I'd just add that, as Rudiger had said earlier, too, uh, the material you're basing your membrane on is going to make up the majority of its actual environmental impact, right? So when you look at polypropylene, polyethylene, things like that, they're um, basically just hydrocarbons. They're olefin-based materials. And those are some of the lowest impact polymers you can you can produce. You know, and you don't have any kind of degradation products with fluorine like you do with EPTFE, obviously, which is a lot of the concerns that go on now. Um, and I think the other thing to notice about um, olefin-based chemistries is there's a lot of work going around in the in the plastics industry to make these materials like um, have a better bio-based impact as well. So. Polypropylene is a little bit behind other materials like polyethylene, but there's a lot of producers of olefins right now that are coming out with bio-based products, and so that's something that Cellguard is actively searching at and um, trying to match our raw material supply with bio-based products. So there's a really clear path there. Um, and then also, as you talk about end of life, although it's not a principal fiber that's used in the textile industry, when you do pair with polypropylene, you have a lot of interesting benefits to go along with it. Um, and there might be some trade-offs too, but there's definitely an end of life story that we have as well. So I think we can hit, you know, beginning of life, um, end of life, and then also offer you a high performance uh, solution in between. Excellent. Thanks. And William, what can you tell us about the, uh, the journey of your products to, uh, to a lower carbon future? Okay, thank God I'm not be forgiven, <laughs> For forgotten. 
So uh, as a TPE manufacturer in China, we do have some you know, uh, ways to deal with uh, recycling things. You, uh, as you mentioned about that uh, people are always trying to you know, uh, find some replacement for, to the PDFE. I think uh, also polypropylene, polyethylene, and also TPE has some ways to deal with this problem. Um, because you know, uh, our company, the, the major part of uh, business is not in the outdoor, material, outdoor industry, it's in the medical. So we create, we have some, you know, the cutoff of the age in every run. So we gathering all this, the cutoffs and also the waste membrane, which is a good material, is not the bad material within our factory. So we gathering those quantities, materials, and then we we remelt it, we do re resin, and then we make the recycled film. So that's a way to you know to save our energy, also save the material. Right, thank you. And now it's moving on to my second question then, and I think some of these have been addressed slightly before, but we could maybe turn this around and think about the performance of the products as well as their sustainability. Is uh, What benefit do your products bring to the, the market for the waterproof breathable membranes? Um, do you start with you, Anstar. Sure. Well, I think the basis starts with, you know, your very first question, you know, about the issue of circularity and, re and recyclability. But I think the the benefits there is, uh, you know, as much as some of the previous presenters in the, uh, how do you say it? Pecha, Pecha Kucha. Pecha Kucha. Thank you. Not familiar. Um, is, is they've indicated. It's not a mountain in South America. No. <laughs> um, it, but again, the ability to eliminate you know, DWRs and you're building in mono materials. Um, the fact that we are solvent free in a polypropylene base, all of those things that in forever chemicals that you can't really get to be able to support and build in sustainability. So I think those are some of the key features, Eric. Yeah, and I think the other big benefit that we bring as a membrane supplier into the, the post PFAS world is really that we're an air permeable membrane, right? So you're not, it's, it's a lot different from an operating mechanism than you have with, uh, you know, what Rudiger or um, William have. It, it operates on uh, Brownian diffusion. So basically it just takes moisture from one side of the membrane to the other without having to diffuse into and back out of the membrane. Um, so I think what Trenchin had talked about earlier in the previous Pecha Kucha that you looked at that. Um, so the advantage that that's gonna bring to you is basically it, it, it makes it so it's, you don't build up sweat within the, the textile as easily um, as you would with a, a monolithic membrane. It doesn't require a high concentration gradient to actually transport moisture from one side of the fabric to the other. Um, so I think that's what one of the most unique things we offer is a, a more sustainable solution, an alternative to PTFE that has that. Just, just to clear it for anyone who doesn't know, the trenchant membrane has lots of little holes in it. It's uh, a microporous membrane. The holes are really small, so water can't come through. That's what makes it waterproof. But they're so they're smaller than water droplets. This was remember this from some marketing back over the many years. But the holes are bigger than water molecules, which is what your sweat is as it evaporates off the surface of your skin. So the water can pass through the pore structure, allowing your sweat to escape. Whereas Rudiger's membrane is a hydrophilic membrane, which makes it monolithic. It's completely solid. So if you're making suits for chemical protective suits, you're not going to use a microporous membrane because the bad things might sneak through the suit and contaminate the man underneath, or woman. Um, whereas you might use Rudiger's membrane because it's completely impermeable and only lets water through because it's a chemical process. Do you want to add some more to that? Well, first of all, I need to say it's not my membrane. It's 35 oh, sorry, years the old company. Sorry, the membrane. Actually. No, no, it's, uh, the, the, it's too much credit to me. The, uh, the patents years. were actual <laughs> Nobel patents, weren't they? Yeah. Um, I, I just joined the tribe about six and a half years ago. And I have to say for one moment, this was my Horeca moment just a few minutes ago when you said in this post-PFAS era. Yeah. And I think that is for a moment we need to take a deep breath and say, hooray, we finally made it. Yeah. When I joined six and a half years ago, it was unimaginable. So we have done one major step to at least mentally, not yet fully physically, ban a material which is 
unbelievable irresponsible in the chemical composition and the manufacturing, and which has by a side effect, which is the climate footprint. So take this aside. Now we're talking on the next level. And, and in the next level, there are a lot of good guys who are doing a lot of good things. Um, for us, we had two things on the agenda, three things on the agenda seven years ago. It was PFAS, it was circularity, and it was climate. These were our top priorities. And we tried to focus on all three of them. PFAS was easy with 35 years of history, and PFAS free, at least from the member inside, now also on the DWR side, tick in the box. But our focus has been on the circularity question. And, and you slightly touched it. Circularity, by definition, by the European Union, by every technician in the market, by everybody, is clear. If, as you described it, we put a product to another product in a lasting combination, either by glue or by coating, this needs to be monomaterial to be recycled. Yes. End of story. Everything is crap. Everything is else is storytelling. And so the monomaterial question will be now the second priority in this industry. And then if we look at the entire textile market, simply speaking, that's, I haven't invented it, you can read it in the internet everywhere, about a third is, we call it bio-based material, let's park all the questions on chemicals and cotton and leather and chromium and so, two thirds are synthetics. From those synthetics, 80% is polyester based. Our membrane is polyester based. So we have a very simple story. We are polyester monomaterial supplier of functional textiles, which allows 80% of the stuff at some point, hopefully very late, going back into recycling, being best prepared for a reasonable, efficient recycling process. So that is for us the number two. Now, we can, of course, debate performance between microporous versus, if we have enough time, uh, hydrophilic, uh, and probably there are also a few arguments, but the key argument is, with 80% functional recycling possibility to the textile, that needs to be the next level. So everybody of all of us needs to be measured by the ability for easy recyclability of the end product. And that is monomaterial. Absolutely. So William, what, what can you add to this discussion? What benefits does your TPE bring? Yeah, I totally agree because, you know, many brands now are trying to find the mono material. So uh, as you said that uh, the 80% of the fabric is uh, polyester based and also 20% is a nylon based. So we, we, we are also trying to find, you know, the polyester membrane with the polyester fabric and then the nylon fabric with the nylon uh, you know, the, the narrow membrane and with, with the nylon fabric. So that's the mono solutions for those, you know, two packages. And then we can do all this close as a uh, whole close recycling. That's the, you know, uh, I think it's the everyone's dream. Well, absolutely. Um, so as has been touched on a few times, if you glue any two things together, uh, in a way that you want them to be durable, to last a long time, then when they open the recycling facility, it's very difficult to separate them. So then you end up with things that um, the sorters will just sort into the discard pile and not into the recycle pile. Um, and I would hope that doesn't happen to Simpatex garments, but it is a problem with the whole sorting world at the moment, isn't it? That if the sorter sees a waterproof, it's complex, it's discard. Um, hopefully things like digital passports might change that in the future, but that won't affect all the garments that are already out of the industry. And there are garments made by Vaude in the 1990s where they were using polyester face fabrics and Simpatex membranes for the very reasons that Rudik has discussed. They were well ahead of the curve. Oddly enough, they dropped it and went to event for a while, which was probably not so great for the environment, but they've, they've learned and, and gone backwards to where they were originally. So. Um, so the, quest the next question I was passed, I've rephrased it ever so slightly. Um, so waterproof breathable membranes, what does it mean? When I teach my undergraduates, I tell them we don't like to call them breathable membranes because if you put a bag of any of these membranes over your head, there's a good chance you'll suffocate. You can't breathe through them. They are moisture vapor permeable membranes. Do you have a different term? Is that one all right? We'll live with that one. There's a few other terms that get kicked out. So they're moisture vapor permeable membranes. 
and nothing is waterproof. If you push hard enough on a sheet of steel, it'll leak. Look at all those submarines lying at the bottom of the sea somewhere. Um, so again, we talk about water resistance. We don't talk about um, waterproof. At least that's what I tell my undergraduates. And then I stand up and talk to people about waterproof breathable membranes because it's what everybody's used to. Um, there are lots of ways that these things can be measured. And some of these techniques further some technologies over others. And for many, many years, it's caused all sorts of argument and discussion in the industry. So the question is, which test methods do you prefer and why? Um, I guess I would start by saying that we don't really prefer a test method. Um, it's more of an application specific question for all of you to decide, you know, what's the best test method for your given application. Um, but from what we've seen and what you all have really taught me in our conversations over the you know, past several years has been that none of these test methods are really perfect. Right, um, A1 describes something different than B1, just describes something different than B2. And so really, the way I look at it as a membrane supplier is how do I make my membrane perform the best as a composite of all these different tests? Um, so A1 is gonna describe much better, obviously, when you're you know, just first start to exert a lot of physical energy. Um, B1 is probably gonna be much better if you're already sweating and you have a really high um, thermal load right then. And then B2 is going to be much better when you don't have that perfect, you know, water to membrane interface. You know, that's not reality in the B1 test. You're not always wetting out the membrane perfectly. So you've got to account for the fact there's going to be air gaps. Um, so I would say I, I don't really have a favorite, like I said, don't really have a favorite test method, but um, we're happy to perform and help you with any of them. That's, yeah, but that's I know, a that's I really think, good answer. Yeah, but Charles, I think also you think of it, though, it's the difference between it's it's so application dependent upon the brand strategy. You know, I know as a former rock climber and an active skier, I don't want to sweat. Okay, I mean, I'm trying to control my body temperature so that I don't sweat and ultimately don't get cold. But yet, when I do, you know, that membrane has a different purpose. So I guess it just really depends on the brand strategy and the designer of their clothing too. I think the intention behind the question was that if you walk around a show like this or outdoor baseball shows like that, um, lots of people are selling their fabrics based on, on some numbers. Right. Um, uh, we're waterproof to 35 meters. We, we offer a breathability of some massive number when tested using this weird technique. Yeah. I mean, one, one company's favorite technique simulates the conditions of the Sahara Desert. I mean, who on earth wears their waterproof jacket from any manufacturer? when they're in the Sahara, but that's a widely used international standard for measuring the water vapor permeability or much of a permeability of, of, waterproof member, of waterproof breathable membrane. So um, you touched earlier on microporous and the way you handle moisture being differently. I know from research done at Leeds many years before my time, by, I've been trying to see if she's in the audience because I didn't want her to throw things at me if I miss said this, but um, somebody who works with her is there, so it will get back to her. Um, that once condensation starts to form inside your garment, the microporous membranes can struggle to deal with that, whereas the hydro hydrophilic ones can move that liquid moisture. So obviously you need to make sure that doesn't happen in, that, in, in those sorts of garments, and that is definitely something that's come through. So, um, Rudiger, what, which, which test do you like to use at Sympatex? Or I, I would yeah. understand if you've got the same answer. Uh, no, I, I, I'm just working on the, on the right answer to the question, because because when I joined this industry, I came from automotive, aerospace, whatever, and you join and you hear a discussion about water column on waterproofness, and I was a bit irritated, so I Googled a bit, and what is the pressure of the 10,000 water column? I found, I, I'm not sure anymore if it's the B hose of a fire brigade or the A hose. Uh, I couldn't imagine a storm, a rain of any of this kind, of course, if the ski instructor sits down too long on the snow, that might be an issue. But I think the first question we need to ask our priority settings. But, but let, uh, just for a moment. So let's, let's take for a moment what are really the priorities and which ones are created artificially. Because sometimes this reminds me of this German poetry or story that Zauberlehrling, what is it, the Sorcerer's Apprentice, where he was at home and then tried to ease his job and then couldn't stop the magic. Uh, it's a bit like this. We created a performance-driven discussion 
but lost a bit sight of what's really needed and what's priority. And secondly, I fully agree with what you said, it depends on the application. We have currently test methods standardized, which are, I get at least the impression sometimes rather for protecting certain markets for certain technologies than really oriented by the application. And as you said, making a hydrophilic membrane and putting it to a static pressure test on breathability doesn't make sense because oh. it's a very different functionality. If you sweat a lot, you better have not the micropores because then the water could, actually the water droplets could stop the pores to breathe. On the other side, if you have only occasional breathing, it may be the same thing or even better to have a micropores one. So I think we need a very fresh discussion to what we want to measure and why we want to measure it and get back closer to the user and, and the user experience. Both of these properties, when we talk about these numbers, we're talking about measuring a piece of fabric that's, I don't know, 10 square centimeters or something. A4 sized if you're doing the old sweating guarded up play or whatever. But as I, again, tell my undergraduates, the, um, the big difference between testing a waterproof jacket and what testing a waterproof fabric is what? Well, one's a, a, an assembled garment and I've got to be careful with my language here. You can make fantastic waterproof jackets out of crap fabrics. Mm -hmm. And you can make really, really, really rubbish garments out of the best fabrics in the world. If your designers aren't up to it, if you get something wrong, you don't tape the seams properly, the hood's the wrong shape. So sometimes I think we get lost in these numbers when they're meaningless. And I mean, Rudy was right. Uh, if, you, if anybody's familiar with BSEN or ENISO 343, which is the standard for protective garments that protect from rain, it sets a hydrostatic column of 1.5 meters. Or is it 1.2? 1.2 meters, actually. And I'd argue that's not enough. But 35 meters is far too far. Um, sorry, William, we've cut you out of this one. Do you, want, do you have anything to add? Do you have any, any thoughts on testing? Yeah, I think, you know, there is no perfect material. So there's a lot of choices for customers to choose. So that's a lot of methods for, for those materials, those films. Just like colors, you like red, I like, I like blue, or you like brown, I like red. So that's no, you know, it's no red and wrong thing. Just, a, you know, um, it depends on the customer, which they want to express, the hydrophilic or hydrophobic, or just as you, say, you guys said, that's uh, according to the surroundings uh, according to the atmosphere yeah I mean in my experience um, well this 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 space in the market for all of these technologies even though they're different and that's something we could bear in mind it'd be a really sad and boring world if only one membrane existed um, the end use is crucial it really is I find I really like microporous membranes but I have found on multi-pitch ice routes that I get cold in the stances in between because they breathe too fast. <laughs> Whereas we apologize like, for doing too good of a job. Yeah, exactly, for performing exactly. well, we apologize, right? Exactly. Um, so yeah, there's the, the, the space for them all, and um, hydrophilics can respond if you sweat a lot um, and it condenses. Because something you should bear in mind is condensation is the the biggest challenge to most of these waterproof breathable garments that get sold. And in the UK at least, somewhere in the region of 90% of returns because a jacket leaks, it weren't because it leaked, it's because the man's sweat condenses on, the person's sweat condenses on the inside and then struck back to their base layers. Um, and the, the part of the problem is that the, the best of the fabrics, the pro fabrics with the highest moisture vapor permeability, they can't handle as much as you can sweat if it's really bad weather conditions and you pull your hood up and you close all the vents down and you shut the entire system down, condensation's inevitable in all waterproof jackets. And I don't think customers understand that. I don't think all designers understand that. So, so um, we're getting close to the point where we need to wrap up and see if there's any um, questions from the audience. But I just wanted to give you all one more opportunity to, to tell us anything you think we've missed that, that you might want the audience to know about your technologies. It's really not about technology, but I think the questions were extremely well chosen um, because we need to ask all three of them. And, and what we need to stop in our industry is really trying to solve one issue or the other issue. You are totally right. Um, there is no perfect material, but 
there are certain criteria we need to embrace which are simply no-goes. And I'm, as I said, I'm very happy that the fluorochemical discussion is very close to an end, even though some still try to protect their turf. But basically, there are no-go criteria we need to embrace. There are criteria of priority, especially in the environmental sector, we have ignored so far we need to look at. And recyclability is something the European Commission has put in a legal framework that will materialize in the next three to five years. So everybody sh would be crazy who doesn't accept this and keeps on doing the things. And then we can have a performance discussion, which needs to probably start from scratch, and we need to all sit on a table and say, hey, what is actually the consumer experiencing, rather than what is what we want to sell? Absolutely. I think in, in support of that, what Rudy says is, um, you know, whether as a brand, you know, you choose to be highly breathable and waterproof, excuse the term waterproof, you know, as in our material, or you're looking to wick water away and still be waterproof. I mean, it, it's very much brand dependent. But I think the thing that's common between us is the goal to create a circular environment and a, an environment of, you know, um, recyclability and, and just, you know, a, a better product that is safer to use. So I think that's something very common amongst us. William, got anything to add? I think, you know, uh, I learned from now the market is that the eco-friendly thing is the tendency for the future. So, um, you know, we, we're trying to do as much as possible to, you know, to teach our customers, teach the, you know, the, um, the, the audience that uh, how to, how we collect the film and how we how we uh, recycle them, but you know uh, this is the future for for the material. So that's why you know in Europe that uh, I think it's 2025 that right 2025 or 2026 that that used uh, PTFE. So everybody is fi trying to find a solution for that. Fantastic, thank you. So now we've got a bit of time for questions. Charles is wandering around with a, a microphone. So if anybody wants to ask any questions, do you want to stick your arm up? Um, I've just had a look at the virtual questions. Come on, world. You're not asking them in intelligent things. But can I make a dumb observation? Two dumb observations, which I'm going to make really quickly before I go to this question. We have had a great insight to circularity. And there are a lot of people who ask about polyester and pure circularity. The problem is the glue for the membrane. If we use a polyester glue, it will not work at the temperatures we work at. So that's still a technical thing. I know that Sympatex are working at it hard because that would make the most sense as the easiest solution. The other observation I want to make is whatever face fabric we use gets wetted out. And I know there are a couple of people much more intelligent than Mark and I about DWRs in this audience. If any of you have read a Patagonia press release recently about their new oil-resistant DWR, the guys from Beyond Surface Technology wanted to come and couldn't come. So not only are we dealing with membrane pr progress, but we then have a DWR discussion, which I think is happening at the October show. But that's Although, ch Charles, I'm under the impression from what I'm hearing from Norway and pla Scandinavian places that it might be time that we drop the D from the DWR. But the first question, um, I, hands please. <laughs> Sorry, Charles. Um, thank you for your explanations. Um, I don't know anything about membrane, uh, but my question goes to circularity. You were all talking about circularity, um, but you mean recycling. What do you do with all the other subjects in circularity? Yeah, so that's a good point. I think circularity is you have responsibility for the material at the beginning and you have responsible for the material at the end. And so from an olefin based material, um, there's a lot of, like I said earlier, um, bio based options coming out. So you can actually source olefins now that are made from like waste oils. You know, so you think uh, if you go to McDonald's and get your French fries, there's a lot of different olefin manufacturers are coming out with technology that uh, turns, the, turns the oil that's used to fry your French fries into polypropylene, polyethylene. Uh, things like that. It also incorporates a manufacturing process too, right? So you have to understand how your membrane or how your fibers are actually made. Um, one of the unique things about our process in comparison to 
most other membrane manufacturers is we use no solvents, we use no additives, um, we strictly manipulate the crystal structure, um, and so how the polypropylene actually forms as it comes out of our equipment, and that's how we make pores. We don't add anything else to it, we don't chemically alter the material, um, so that's a unique aspect that helps make us um, a good option for environmentally friendly on the process side. And then, as you mentioned too, obviously having an end of life solution is always good as well. So with polypropylene face fabrics, you do have that option uh, if you choose to take it. Um, can I go to a... There's a follow-up right. question, Charles. Nikki, we can't hear, unless you've got a microphone. Do you want, okay. Um, can I go to a virtual Charles, question? Charles, um, Charles, yeah, I just wasn't quite sure if we got your question right. I understood we talk more on recyclability. What about collection and other things? Is that the question or was that fine? No, true, uh, re being responsible for your material and keeping it in the loop as long as possible without recycling. Because recycling is really the last R in the whole range. Uh, absolutely, but does that goes without saying that that's true for any product, whatever it is, it should, you should maximize its life, you should encourage people to reuse it. My, my jeans have a big logo in that says, give them to somebody else when you don't want them anymore. Um, so, but the point here is that when it reaches its inevitable end of life, because it will have one, they can be recycled, which is perhaps better than it going into landfill and biodegrading and giving off methane and CO2, which are both greenhouse gases. Um, one of the best things about, say, polyester, that's one I can speak about, it can, be it, it can be recycled infinitely. You can rebuild polymer change using SSP, LSP, so you don't lose performance. So, yes, it's terrible that it's a forever thing, but if the fact that we can keep making it back into something, and the problem at the moment is we're not. 99% of all recycled polyester is made from those, and that's the crime. Sorry. And, and, and if, I, if I may add, I think your question is very good. It's probably our blind spot because we are in a high performance material. Durability for us is a given, it's a hygienic factor. And, and I would say if we look at fast fashion, of course, the right question. Uh, if I may compare it a bit to the happiness question, there are many reasons why you get unhappy, but that's are not the same ones that make you happy. So it's a hygienic factor. So I think durability, those questions need to be hygienic factor. This needs to be granted. But then the next level is, and I think that starts from the design, we need to design products that whenever they reach the end of their life, they are recyclable. Because otherwise you can make the line longer, but it will never become a circle. We do have one virtual question. The virtual question is curious. Is it possible to create a single membrane, a single material membrane inclusive of glue? Ideally, something that matched the shell to make the mono material that may be recycled. I think we've half covered that, but would you like to add something I, to the conversation? I think it's a great, great question. We take this apart and then we share the proprietary rights for the innovation. But I need to correct Charles a little bit. We have done tests in 2018-19 when we created a consortium. Even a mechanical recycling process can easily cope with a little bit of PU glue in the process. It's not perfect, and there's things to go, and we research for polyester materials and glues and how we can combine it. That's still a question. Rudiger's right, 5% impurity they can cope with. I, mm. Rudiger always pulls me up. We regularly have debate, but he's right. 5% contamination we're able to achieve. Yeah, and the glue is about two. Could probably make a completely mono material garment now out of a membrane. I mean, the Inuits used to do this. They'd turn the um, intestines of seals into waterproof jackets. Um, the thing is, nobody would buy them and wear them because people like the look and feel of fabrics, they don't like the look and feel of membranes. So things need to change if that's the route. But so any more questions from the audience? Okay, ah. Oh, it's him. For those of you who don't know, this is one of the DWR specialists, Tim. Um, I was interested in sort of the, the lifespan of some of these new um, membrane materials because obviously things like uh, polypropylene are possibly more susceptible to UV damage and especially when combined with face fabric. So is there enough sort of field testing and uh, evidence that these are as durable as sort of previous membrane technologies and indeed uh, you know, 
Symptex and other systems? Um, yeah, so I mean, I'd just say we've been in commercial production for, I don't know, three or four years Five now. Years now. Well, yeah, I can't remember the exact date. Um, but so there is some significant life on a lot of, the pro on a lot of these products. Um, polypropylene, you can definitely add UV resistant additives to it and everything like that, and you can get very good um, UV performance out of that. So if you go and look, you look, look at a lot of outdoor patio furniture, um, the fabric that's selected a lot of times for that is polypropylene, right? So that's going to be a much more uh, intensive UV process than what you're going to see on a microporous membrane, you know, where we're buried underneath a couple of different layers. But it's a valid point, um, but it has an addressable solution, I think, in the PP. Anybody else? Rudiger, do you want to contribute to that UV uh, conversation? It's one of the very few questions I have this kind of relaxing moment because I don't <laughs> think I'm concerned. But I, th I think it's the right question. I mean, at the end, we can invent as many tests as we said before as we want. Reality will show, and we have seen a lot of technologies. And, and I have great respect to everybody joins. I think if we take PTFE finally out, there is a huge cake we can all share, and we will not end up hungry. But but I think at the end of the day, the practical implication will show, and then we see with always a prerequisite that we have ticked the boxes of recyclability because that will be the killer, the next killer point. Yeah, do you have anything to add to this, William? Uh, I think UV problems, um, it, it depends on you. How, uh, how long did you want to use it? <laughs> if you want to use it in lifetime, then you add the UV more. But uh, as a you know a jacket maybe just f uh, wear five or five to ten years. Uh, as our material, I think P uh, TPE didn't face this kind of uh, UV problems. But uh, polypropylene, I I don't know. But uh, for for me, I didn't uh, have this kind of concern. I think the membranes themselves are relatively protected, unless it's shake dry type technology where you turn it inside out. But then that's a different thing. Yeah, but that's true. The, the and, and to be fair with my competitors, normally I don't wear a rain jacket when the sun is shining. So that <laughs> might also be a reason. <laughs> True. <laughs> so, but the membrane's protected, but the first fabric's may degrade. Or, but as uh, was said, you can add UV stabilizers um, to any polymer these days, can't you, that absorb the and removes the problem. So. It's a really intelligent question, and we've not revealed enough about Mark. If we talk to the public, the biggest hassle we have in our industry is the plastic going into the ocean in their perceptions, textile wash-offs. Um, Dr. Taylor's not gone into detail, but he is the guy who has developed the microfiber consortium wash test principle that looks at shedding. I know you were part of a team that did it, but having conversations with Mark, he's done it for original fabrics. If we were to UV expose every fabric for, let's say, 80 hours, there would be a different set of results. We started doing that. <laughs> so I'm not up to date enough. Yeah, no, we've, we've started UV edging fabrics, simulating sunlight, and then looking at the shedding of the microfibers. It's an interesting process, but uh, it's a bit too early to talk about. But there was a young lady at the back of the room. I think she's just here now. She was the first researcher we employed on this. Um, and it's not me. It was a team. Although on the 28th of February, an ISO standard reached that state where you can all down pay for it and download it now and that is the standard we wrote basically which, which if i may say is fantastic because most of the microfiber discussion we currently have is around the washing process we have done a lengthy study with Qantas and clearly identified together with them that the problem from the fibers not only comes from the washing, but more than 90% comes from the discarded garments somewhere in the desert and in landfill. And then we are back to the UV resistance because that is the criteria for discarded garments. If and we don't and where as well, them. just if you when the when the light conditions are right, you're looking any space and you'll see fibers floating around. Although we've got to be really careful with that, though, because 80% of them will be cellulose. And just to close it off, one fi final question. Short answers, please. Uh, a virtual question. Are the energy inputs required that are required to recycle materials taken into account when calculating the carbon footprint of a membrane? So when you're looking at effectively the LCA of a membrane, have you included the extra energy to recycle it? Clear, yes. Superb answer. Very, very simple, yes. 
if I may add something to the complexity. No, no, no. We're literally okay. closing in one minute. Then I just said yes. William, question to you. On the LCA, do you make an allowance for the recycling energy for your membranes? Yes, of course. <laughs> Superb. And finally, to the cell guard duo. It's in our calculation. Um, which is a wonderful way to show that we have standards we are working to as an industry, but these are the questions you should ask of your membrane manufacturers. We think we've got three of the best practice ones, and can I ask you to show your appreciation for everyone who's part taken part? Uh, thanks, Japs. It's been really good. Thank you. We're going to take a 10-minute break, then we're back to the second set of Petra Kuchas. So we're going to have five different fabric converters offering permeable waterproof membranes. We're going to start off with Pertex. We're then on to Dimpora. Uh, we then go to Xpor by BenQ, followed by Amphibio, and concluding with Sympatex, who are the people who made uh, hydrophilic popular in the first place. Another 10 minutes and we'll go to the next stage of Petra Kuchas. <laughs> 